Welcome to a new video in the introduction series of videos to systems biology. In this video, we will uh, ask the question how to decide whether or not to reject the model. Uh, and this is sort of introduction to statistical tests. It will be some really conceptual basics of, uh, of how to do things. So, so this is the video to start with when you want to um, understand the basics of statistical tests. And uh, as before, this is part of the teaching material of ISP group. Uh, you can free to use it as long as you say where it's from. And we have now learned how to formulate the model and we are uh, here now up, uh, up here learning to, to, uh, to draw conclusions from the data. So we are really at the end of this first step here. We have fitted the model to the data and we are wanting to make a decision. Should we reject the model or should we uh, keep it and move on to the second step? So let's just repeat some basic concepts and see what we will go through here during this video. So uh, we have now achieved a model which has some simulated output y hat for some optimized parameter, so some optimal parameters that agrees with the measured output as good as you can imagine. So that's um, that's what we have, and the, and the basic idea is to compare these two and 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 ask the question: Is this good enough or not? And the most important thing, and the thing that you always should start with, I would say, is to just compare these by looking at them. So you just uh, plot this one and this one in the window and then uh, in the same window and then you see does this seem like a good fit or not. Um, but then when you sort of have a, a, a feeling yourself it's, it's, uh, it is a strength to also combine this with statistics. But uh, but I would say that you should never replace your own feeling for for the system, which you get by just looking uh, with statistical tests. So statistical test is a sort of complement and a support to, to your own inspection. And then what can you do? Uh, what kind of questions do you ask? Well, the most important or the most common question is to ask whether the model uh, that uh, have achieved the simulation is good enough or not. But then you also ask some other questions. So. Uh, uh, first, first, there are some more specific questions to this question. Uh, is the model good enough or not? And uh, one, maybe the most common uh, question to ask if, is whether the residuals are too big. But then you can also ask another question, which is a sort of sub-question. Uh, are the residuals too correlated? And then uh, there is an altogether different question that you can ask. And that is if you have two models and, and you have one model that is slightly better than the other and you ask the question, is this difference significant or not? So that's a sort of altogether other question. Um, and then finally, we will also go, go through the importance of cross-validation. And uh, what is a little bit associated with, with this is the risk of overfitting. And again, all of these things we will just go through now in a very conceptual, basic understanding sort of way. And then in future videos, we will go through the formalize behind these things. So the first question, is the model good enough? And now let's just look at the agreements and see um, what to look for. So here we have one example of how, how things can look. And here we have some simulation data. So this would be the y hat for some optimized parameter, p hat. And then we, here we have some data points. Uh, and then the residuals, uh, as we have learned in previous videos, is simply the, diff, the, the distance between the simulated output and the measured output. And um, here we see that um, we have some measurement uncertainty here. But um, the simulated output is always, always uh, outside this uncertainty. And uh, even though it's not uh, that far away, apart from some cases here, it's like 
uh, maybe three standard deviations away, uh, it's it's always out. So so here the problem is that uh, the, the residuals are systematically and uh, too much bigger than the uncertainty in the data. So here we have two big residuals. But if we look at the at this, um, the sign of the residuals, um, here we have a positive one and here we have uh, some negative ones. Here we have a positive one again and a negative one. So uh, sometimes there are two in a row that are negative, but, uh, but uh, there are no big trends that you have long time always positive or always negative. So here we have uh, the problem of two large residuals, so we are too far away from the data. If this is a true uh, assessment of the measurement uncertainty, it could be here that uh, here uh, we have underestimated the, the uncertainty in the data. But if we haven't, so if this is the true uncertainty of the data, then we have the problem that uh, that uh, we have two large, two large residuals, but they are not correlated. Uh, so there is no way of guessing whether the whether the data will be above or below by by knowing what was the case for the for the previous model. Uh, here we sort of have the opposite situation. So here we have some some simulated data, uh, some y hat, and some measurement data. And here we see that uh, the simulation always goes within the the measurement uncertainty, but it always goes slightly below. Uh, the mean, so it's always in the lower half, and therefore uh, here we have the problem that if it is in the lower half for the previous data point, this seems to argue that it's it stays within the lower half. So it's not like here where it's sort of the, sometimes above and sometimes below. Here it's always below. So here we have the opposite problem: the size of the residuals is not a problem, but the correlation is a problem. They are always on the same side. And this then, uh, you can see now by looking at the model that this one um, has one problem but not the other, and, and here we have the, the other problem but not the first. And uh, generally in systems biology, you consider this to be a bigger problem, that, uh, that you have two, uh, two large uh, residuals, and, and this is something that you more often neglect. Uh, but strictly speaking, this is also a problem if you want to sort of have an optimal model. So let's now convert these two types of, of assessments to statistical tests. And then let's first just repeat what is a statistical test. Well, a statistical test is something that is based on a null hypothesis. And then you sort of have a test and you see whether you can reject the null hypothesis or not. So you have some value and then you see whether that lies outside where the null hypothesis typically lies. Um, and um, here it's important to remember that you only conclude something if the null hypothesis is rejected. So if the null hypothesis is not rejected, you, you, you usually don't reject it. You usually don't conclude anything. You just say that now we can't say anything. And since the thing that we want to say with some kind of accuracy is that the model can be rejected, this means that we need to assume in the null hypothesis uh, that the thing we are testing is not a problem. So um, for the chi-square test, what, what we want to test if the, is if the residuals are too big. So if the residuals are too big, as we had in the left uh, case here in the previous slide, uh, then we want to reject the model using the chi-square test. And then we need to assume uh, the opposite. So we need to assume that the residuals are small. Because if the residuals are uh, small in the null hypothesis and we reject the null hypothesis, the opposite has to be true. So then they have to be big. And this is what we test in the chi-square test. And um, the other problem was that the residuals could be correlated. Uh, and since we want to uh, find out if that is the case or not, we have to assume the opposite. We have to assume that they are not correlated. Uh, and then we uh, see whether we can reject that null hypothesis or not. And that thing is tested by a whiteness test or a darwin watson test or a RAM test or uh, something, um, something on that uh, sort. So, uh, if we sum this up in a table here, we uh, have uh, two set, 
two tests that we have sort of already uh, introduced the basic idea of the chi-square test. We test the size of the residuals. And the null hypothesis is, loosely speaking, in a sort of simplified way, it is that the residuals are small. Um, it's, in principle, you can imagine that they are too small also, but uh, so, so a sort of more formal, uh, formal way of formulating this would, would be something of the sort that the residuals um, are of the same order of magnitude as you would expect given the um, standard deviation of the measurement uncertainty something of that sort. And we will go through the formulas of this in, in, in follow-up videos. But here, the, the basic principle be behind the chi-square test is that you have small residuals. Uh, and then, if you can reject the null hypothesis, you assume that the model is rejected because the residuals are too big. But if you don't reject the null hypothesis, you basically don't conclude anything. Or you, 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 you just say that for the data we have now, we don't know whether we can uh, whether 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 the model is um, is correct or not. So for the moment, we don't conclude anything. For the whiteness test, it's the other way around. That um, we we want to reject the model if the if the null hypothesis is rejected, and we look at the correlation. So the null hypothesis that the, is that um, uh, the residuals are, are not correlated, and if we don't reject the hypothesis, we don't conclude anything. So this is for uh, looking at a single model. And here we have um, the likelihood ratio test, which is the final test that you should know in this little introductory course, uh, which uh, instead compares two models. And you have one model that is uh, slightly better than the other one. And you want to know whether the worst model is significantly worse. Uh, and then you have to assume the opposite. You assume that the models are equally good, which is also a simplified view of what you actually uh, assume. But for now, this is this is good enough. Uh, so you assume that the models are equally good. And if you can reject that, then then uh, you uh, you basically assume that the worst model uh, is significantly worse. So uh, this basically means that if you would do the experiment again, the worst model would be expected to be worse again. And again, uh, if uh, the null hypothesis that the models are equally good uh, is um, not rejected, you don't conclude anything. Or you just say that the difference we have now between the two models is not, um, uh, is not significant. So um, let's uh, do some visual insights. Uh, when comparing two models, and that will also lead us to understanding the point of validation data. But here I should say that validation data is not something that is specific to a, to a comparison of two models, but it's also something that has benefits uh, when you want to look at a single model as well. So let's uh, take this situation again here, uh, where we have a model and we have some, um, some residuals, uh, and then let's consider the case where we have a competing model. So the competing model here has uh, simulations in red. And here it certainly looks, just by looking at this, that, that the competing model is a better model. It goes through all the data points. And sometimes it's slightly above and sometimes it's slightly below the mean. But it's, this really seems like a really good model. Uh, but even this model here is not necessarily um, the best model. Uh, so it seems like it's better here when we look at, at this model. Uh, but uh, now if uh, a, a key question here is what would happen if we would look at new data? So data that the model hasn't seen, data that we haven't fitted the model to. And then what would happen then? That is a key question. So if we would have some new data here in green, uh, which the model hasn't seen before, the question is which of the, uh, which of the two models would be the best at describing this data? And then if we look at this model here, which uh, seemed to be the worst one, it seems like it's sort of equally bad as before, but also equally good. It's not, uh, it, it's sort of a decent approximation given this simple description. Um, and here, 
we don't know what will happen with this one, but there are basically two cases. Either it sort of keeps being really good, and then we are sure that, okay, this is a really good model, it really goes through. So this is a, an acceptable improvement. But it could also be that uh, when we look at new data, um, this model that was better suddenly is the worst model. So, so uh, suddenly it might put, do some completely unwarranted behavior here. It goes down and becomes widely oscillating and really negative values and then goes really to crazy, uh, crazy predictions. So in this case, this would actually be the worst model. And um, since this is something that can happen, uh, a good thing to do is to do this division of models or data that the model sees when you're when you're finding the parameters so estimation data that you're estimating the data to and then you save some some data which you call validation data and this validation data you sort of use for testing the model in the end so you have some validation data for for testing the model in the end and uh, this sort of brings us to the problem of overfitting and uh, the problem of overfitting, you can see if you uh, have uh, um, many models that you sort of sort in how complex they are or how, how flexible they are, how, how good they are at describing a wide variety of data. So the more uh, complex the model, the more flexible the model is, the more to the right we are here. And then we here look at agreement with data, but we look at agreement with data, not only for the estimation data, where the more flexible the model, the more complex the model, the better you are describing the data per definition. Uh, but we also look at it for the validation data. Then we typically have a curve that looks something like this. So for a while, the, the more complex the model, uh, the, the better it is at describing the estimation data, it's also better at describing the validation data. But then there comes a point where the, you get too uh, much fixated on describing the estimation data so that this comes at the price of describing new val validation data worse and worse and worse. So this thing we had for the, for the red model in the previous slide. So in this case, we sort of have an optimal model size, which is sort of here. So, and then if you look at the... If you have validation data, then you can you can simply sort the models very easily by just by just uh, uh, seeing how good they are describing the validation data. But if you don't have the uh, validation data, then you somehow need to punish model complexity so that you don't run into this problem of having overfitted models. And this uh, punishing of model complexity, this is, this is one of the key things to do when you create formulas for these different statistical tests that we have seen. So we have seen tests that punish uh, or that look at various types of properties. And to punish model complexity is something that is really important in these statistical tests. And if you if you do have validation data, usually you can just look at how good it is at describing this validation data. But if you don't have it, um, then somehow need to punish model complexity. And now in the future videos, when we look at the various formulas, we will see that this punishment of model complexity will be one of the key things to look at. Okay, so this was simply the basic conceptual introduction. And these are all the things that you need to know for the, the mini examination in this introduction course. Um, yes, so that's it for now.